and welcome to Noclip, the podcast about the people who play and make video games. I'm your host, Danny O'Dwyer. Our guest this week is a tech and politics writer and workers' rights advocate with bylines on gamesindustry.biz, Kotaku, and The Guardian, among others. She's also a YouTuber on her channel, Left Left Up, where you can watch her insights on gaming and tech news from a radical perspective. Today, we're going to talk to her about game dev unionization, as she is also chair of communications committee for Game Workers Unite International, a global grassroots organization of game workers organizing unions to improve working conditions within the industry. Speaking to us from our home in London, England, I'm delighted to be joined by Marianne Dichkevita. Marianne, thanks for taking the time to talk to us this week. Hi, Danny. Thank you so much. Thank you for a lovely introduction and for covering these important issues. No problem. Our pleasure. I think it's something that uh, we've had a bit of a blind spot on uh, for the, the two and a half years we've been working. So I'm delighted to sort of uh, start the conversation. Uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts, because I have a lot of uh, questions for you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where did you grow up? What were some of the games that sort of inspired you as a, as a, as a young person? So I grew up in Lithuania and as it being Eastern Europe, we, ha we were really big with Counter-Strike and Quake and Quake is something that definitely continued with me. I am an avid player of Quake Champions right now and I sort of, I, I was thrown as an economic migrant in L to London around when I was 17 and was still playing a lot of gaming. However, in the leftist circles that I found myself in, uh, gaming was judged. I don't know, it just seemed to be seen as this sort of waste of time kind of activity. Whereas in 2017, I know it has overtaken the films industry in terms of profits. So it is a huge political space. It's the biggest cultural outlet there is. And how our progressives have really not been in that space and really abandoned it. And in that vacuum, obviously, right wing uh, politics have developed. So I've sort of taken it on myself uh, about two years ago to to try and change this and to try and encourage uh, progressive voices and a critical view in this in this industry uh, out of that. So yes, I've written for quite a few um, publications, Games Industry, Biz, Kotaku, Vice, the rest. I've developed my, uh, my uh, video series. And then a year ago, things have really changed, obviously, uh, with what happened at GDC. And obviously, I'm alluring to the Game Workers Unite a movement being born so I was just extremely it seemed like all of my loves like kind of came together my love for class war my love for trade unionism and my love for gaming so obviously I was extremely privileged and uh, lucky to be at the right time in the right place and get involved yeah, so I guess we're mostly here talking about Game Workers Unite International, which is coming up on its first birthday because it was sort of founded out of GDC last year. Is, is that right? Yes, it's actually incredible that it was only a year ago and hence, and still so much has been achieved. Yeah, so IGDA had a silly idea of doing a panel discussion that was fairly anti-union. Uh, they, you know, they posed the question of whether unionizing is the way to go in this industry. I think they kind of were understanding that there's already a bit of a um, a bit of a movement or at least a quiet talk about about unionization. I think they freaked out and uh, wanted to sort of, you know, wag their finger being like, no, no, it's going to be very, very bad for the industry if you do. So, yeah, but people weren't into that. So hashtag Game Workers Unite started trending. A logo by Scott Benson was created, a Twitter account, a website. That was all, you know, incredible work was done by at, at that GDC by a few dedicated uh, organizers, Emma Kinema being one of them and it really hit the nerve it seems like that's just something that that was just that was a culmination of, of very very many things and chapters sprung up all across the world so there are most of the states in well quite a few states in the US Canada we've got Brazil we got obviously UK France Belgium Germany um, Australia New Zealand Singapore is about to also have a game workers in that branch so it, it was born it exploded and obviously a very very important moment for this movement happened in December when Game Workers Unite UK uh, declared to be the first legal trade union of, of this entire effort. So it's actually amazing in the space of what, seven, eight months, they got themselves together and formed a legal trade union and quite a few other uh, places are not now talking about it too. So 
yeah, it's 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 incredibly inspiring. I am very sad I won't be able to make it to the one year parties at GDC. But everyone, if 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 our Saturday's launch is anything to go by, it's gonna be a sick party and everyone should go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us a little bit about um, Game Workers United UK and the sort of uh, the collaboration with uh, IWGB, which is I understand it is sort of like a um, a gig economy trade union. Um, can you tell us a bit about sort of how that um, I guess relationship uh, was formed and I guess the 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 goals that uh, GWU UK um, has uh, as, a, as a sort of chapter onto itself because you guys have like a it's almost like a distributed sort of organization right like everything is kind of locally uh, operated certainly I have it was it's been the privilege of my life to be so close to the birth of this trade union it really in uh, in March 2018, when I saw what was happening in, in GDC, it seemed like all of my worlds kind of collided, you know, my love for <laughs> trade unionism and my love for class war, my love for video games. So I had to definitely get involved. And Declan Peach was already uh, organizing a Discord chat uh, here in the UK. And we had uh, our first national meeting in Manchester at the beginning of June. And I was just so incredibly inspired by what workers were, uh, how they were organizing in a very horizontal manner and yet because uh, you know there was a lot of work involved to to establish and it wasn't really just based in London I think seven cities uh, or seven or eight cities in the in the United Kingdom have all got their own local chapters where they all meet and discuss the issues and sort of uh, and try to 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 raise the membership and raise the uh, the awareness uh, around so basically yeah so uh, summer came and went there was a lot of sort of talk and meetings with different trade unions because basically we had three routes one was to create a completely new trade union from scratch which would require quite a few thousands of pounds and a lot of lawyer time and in general just a lot of resources something that we didn't feel like we had at the mo at that particular moment uh, second um, second route was to join one of the big trade unions so unite or unison who have like two million uh, members uh, or back to so we that so again the organizers have definitely had quite a few meetings with them over the summer but then i think everything fell into place around september when we met iwgb independent workers union of great britain is only about four years old it's a small dynamic quite militant trade union that is mostly um whose members are mostly migrant workers working in very precarious condition, uh, conditions and industries such as cleaners and foster care workers, the Leroux couriers, Uber drivers. So, you know, really the people that are often on zero hours contracts, sometimes just cash in hand. So again, people that really have, that are sort of at the, at the, at the, at the I guess the most precarious contracts. So sometimes, you know, I hear people like, but what about QA workers? Surely they're so going to be so difficult to unionize because they're so precarious. I'm like, no, guys, the VGB is like, if they got like the LaRue couriers covered, like I think QA testers are going to be just <laughs> fine. So and, and that meeting was, I think, the beginning of, 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 of sort of realizing that GWK has found home because it's not going to swallow up. Um, the branding, it's its a small, effective trade union and it's really allowed for GW UK organizational structures to be st stay in place, all the branding and the relationship with the international, etc. And was really excited to to work with another industry that is not traditionally unionized. And and again, on our side, the WGB only has like 3000 members. So again, sort of every penny uh, and also the president of the union only earns like London living wage plus one pound, you see. So again, it's not one of those often corrupt and, and bloated trade unions. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, it's a union where you can see where your monthly dues are certainly going. And yeah, in December, there was an inaugural meeting. Executive committee was, um, was uh, elected. It was a packed meeting. So many members turned up. I think the membership is a good couple of hundred now and growing every day. And at that inaugural meeting, three pearl three pillars were uh, sort of campaign pillars were discussed. They're, they are sort of around uh, crunch, pay and diversity. That's a quite a long document that at some point I'm sure will be uh, published in detail. Right. And those will be the campaign goals for the next year. Excellent. So that's, I guess, uh, what the, the, the key focus is for, for GW UK. Are, do, do you find that everyone within the organization kind of has had in some way been affected by either, you know, zero contract hours or crunch or, or do you find that a lot of your members are, or the members of the UK um, uh, chapter, as it were, uh, are sort of 
pr more so protecting themselves against the eventuality that perhaps within their career at some stage they'll run into that sort of thing. So it's difficult to um, to really say what what was the main decision for every member to join. They uh, I think they all come from you know very varying different contracts and very different parts of, of of the country and in various different parts of the games industry. Uh, some treat it just as an insurance in case in case they get fired, uh, the union would be able to uh, to negotiate uh, severance pay uh, and etc. So they won't just be out out in the out in the cold as such and some really have probably had terrible experiences perhaps around uh, you know harassment or uh, or um, you know just the, the crunch and that sort of stuff so and they are, are, are thinking and they separate that perhaps they have individual uh, issues that they would like to bring up however the union and this is sort of a public service announcement the union can only deal with um, with incidents or any issues that have only sprung up three months before one joining the union so although you know someone could be like oh two years ago this and this happened the union can't necessarily help with that and yeah so so sometimes it's you know only individual com uh, members of a particular company that will be joining a union to protect themselves but obviously the more workers in a particular company are unionizing the better because then they as a whole body at least as a majority can push you know not only just be on the defensive they can push for better working conditions for for bigger pay for for less crunch for um a bigger bar <laughs> in their <laughs> office or something <laughs> more you know, ping pong the, tables yeah well actually i say this but i'm i'm i'm, I'm joking here but actually it's uh, that's the sort of irony that a lot of people think that because there is there there is you know yeah a pool table or an arcade in the office that there it is this some sort of glamorous industry whereas actually quietly people are really suffering and under this under this allure that they should be lucky to be in this industry um, so for instance this uh, the, the you know that they really are hiding their terrible um, experiences the secretary of, of GW UK Austin Kelmore has written a very eloquent piece with his um, experiences a couple of years ago where he was under a hundred hour a crunch, you know, and he he was by himself in the office with, with one other co-worker and on his birthday and it was his birth his co-worker's birthday as well and in around 1 a.m. they just shared oh. a drink like a cat of coca-cola at like 1 a.m. for 15 minutes as their happy birthday and then had to go back to work. So again, people that are in the executive committee that are um, that are, you know, the front of this union that are going to be making decisions um, mostly and again, these are elections. One can be an exec committee every year and put themselves out there. They really know and they see the darkest of, of this trade union. Uh, two other exec committee members, they are freelancers. So again, we got freelancers covered as well. Um, as long as there is some sort of contract, whether, you know, obviously mostly helps if it's written, uh, the union will have you covered. And IWGV has, uh, in, you know, experience with, with working uh, with professions that, that, you know, are kind of hardly, that, that they're now literally having to argue in court that they're workers. So the IWGP has actually won in court um, to, to, to now class Deliveroo, Deliveroo couriers as workers, something that was not in the UK employment law before. Right. So IWGP, although tiny, it is not afraid to take on the big shots. So let's talk a little bit about then, I guess, trying to get people on board, right? So your your role is obviously, uh, you're the chair of the communications committee for the sort of the international umbrella group is a word that sort of oversees a lot of what, what's going on in these localized chapters. Um, uh, the f sort of forward facing stuff that I guess uh, you sort of talk about is the parties and the social aspect of it. I'm interested in the sort of utility of that type of thing. Like why, why is, you know, uh, having these sort of meetups important, these sort of more um, relaxed, uh, you know, social in gatherings. Why is that important? And, and also, I guess, you know, what's the barrier to stop people from from joining a trade union? I, I understand from, you know, I grew up in Ireland and I, I lived in England for a number of years and sort of the, the image of the trade union, you know, either by, you know, sort of the, you know, uh, uh, elements within the political establishment, which would make you, you know, fund that sort of like negative image or, or via the sort of the, the corrupt nature of some trade unions over the years it's that sort of like you know 80s idea or the 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 sort of tfl stuff in more recent years um do you have to like fight against that sort of negative image of of what a trade union um 
like some people has seen and and is there a reticence from people to join up who are part of larger studios because it might negatively impact their their um their employment like what what's the how do you you know convince people to get on board and what's the sort of utility of having these social gatherings you're completely right there is certainly a stereotype of of trade union that we're trying to fight i'd like to think that as part of these small more new militant trade unions that have sprung up the new trade unionism as i call it we are really challenging uh the the, the view of, of trade unions who are you know let's be honest i'm not gonna beat around the bush most trade unions are rubbish like they just are they have been obviously there's been a political project in the past 40 years especially here in britain to really dismantle trade unions to to create this bad rep around them but they're not helping themselves a lot of the time as well a lot of the time they're they're bloated pale male stale sometimes corrupt they're 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 in bed with the employers rather than employees you know you pay your monthly dues and then an issue arises and you can never even get in touch with the trade union that happens that has happened i am not gonna i am not going to sit here and and defend the entirety of trade unionist movement because it has failed and failed workers again i would separate iwgb from that because uh, it is it's worker led completely and it has already proven itself in the last four years in its militancy and dynamism uh, sort of the uh, the, the sort of di- dynamics that it that it reproduces and this is where i think the social stuff comes in uh, just to sort of plug but also reflect on the incredible two weeks that we had with game workers united international where we have pushed for something called gwirl which uh, eight cities across the world got, um, uh, have utilized and attempted and thus far we've had incredible uh, response so basically we've uh, asked for our local chapters to do uh, just whether that's a small dinner party or a huge rave how it happened in the uk just create something <laughs> along you know just just create a real life gathering because we think that you know especially in such alienating industry as as the games industry um, real life relations are are so important that's where people you know establish solidarity with each other that's where they meet each other and something that is something as abstract as workers rights becomes part of their every day it creates that empathy and creates that you know that solidarity between workers which is something that will be necessary whenever some problem will arise you know whenever we will ask for numbers to whether to you know to start with something simple as sign a petition whether that is to come out on the streets and be there with us so for instance the different branches between um uh, so iwgb is sick at throwing parties mostly they're like salsa dance parties they're incredible <laughs> but the reason why they do it is because they have many different branches right so there's a electricians branch, couriers branch, cleaners branch, foster care branch, well there is now gamers branch and Mm -hmm. they by themselves don't necessarily have the numbers but if those all of those meet each other and and dance and then uh, and create those relationships uh, we know that for instance electricians will turn up to the cleaners protest or game workers will help in terms of IT for the couriers branch let's say you see so rather than these being abstract groups they then meet, they dance, they perhaps share a cocktail, and it all becomes a lot more real. And I think so much of our activism in general, and so much of our political organizing, but uh, I, I, it just can be so, you know, we're, we're so often just on the defensive, we're defeated, and it can just be a drag in it. Whereas those moments of, 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 of victory, of empathy, of, of, creation, of, of creation of a communal experience, you know, that's that's what it's meant to be that's why that's how sustainable political projects work and that's how sustainable um workplaces should be as well you know when people have empathy to each other when when workers understand that uh that uh, 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 something that problematic has hap- that has happened with one worker can very much happen to them and and creating that empathy to each other is is sort of at the core of the of of the trade union movement as it should be not this sort of like client versus uh, service provider relationship that some of the bigger unions have 
uh, kind of perpetrate it a bit more. Uh, so, yeah, and again, we're kind of utilizing in our communications, we're utilizing or we're planning to utilize more innovative ways to uh, to to talk about union unionizations, whether that's Twitter takeovers or a podcast or, or yeah, just a, another push for these IRL events and uh, perhaps also establishing solidarity with existing strikes of so the teacher strike in America or perhaps Wetherspoons and McDonald's worker strike here in the UK. Right. Sorry, I'm being very UK US centric here, but I guess this is just, uh, just these are these are the sort of places that I'm personally working with right now. However, I'm mm. obviously supporting the local chapters all across the world. Uh, but yeah, so we're just looking at, at, at ways to um, to to raise a, to, to raise awareness towards our issues, but also to inspire broader political education and class based um, sort of ins class based politics inspiration towards the towards the new generations. Like the idea for me that some like perhaps sixteen year old that is playing Fortnite that perhaps looks at Game Workers Unite Twitter account and sees that there are actually you know lots of cool gatherings happening mm. and and that's this that's the hook for them rather than this kind of like boring statistics on work you know. That, and that's the hook for them, and they get excited about what this could be and their politics shift. You know, to me, that that is a really exciting part of what what we could be broadly achieving. Yeah, let, let's talk about that sort of the other side of the transaction, I guess, which is which is game players. I mean, uh, the audience is sort of no clip enjoys. We do have a lot of developers who watch our documentaries and listen to the podcast, and we, obviously we also have a lot of game players um, who do the same thing as well. And we try and sort of bridge that gap. And I know that a lot of the folks in our community and our patrons um, have been sort of asking about what it is they can really do, like in terms of boots on the ground activism, be it you know online sort of stuff or actual like in real life, as you said that more substantive um, action that they can do um, uh, uh, to, to sort of help out. I, I guess I sort of have um, uh, the general question of how people can help. And also, I'm just sort of interested in how you feel about engaging with the sort of online discourse in relation to this. Um, you know, we live in a, in a post Gamergate world, and it's, it seems now that most people sort of widely understand that, you know, the, the, the Trojan horse of consumer advocacy that was sort of used in that was not sincere, and it really it was... Just just a bunch of uh, horrible uh, bad actors you know attempting to target women and minorities within the games industry so is it is is the idea of getting into the sort of um, the the consumer advocacy world or the way in which you know the the online discourse over this sort of stuff is that something that you think uh, the game workers unite should be engaging with or is it something you kind of are keeping at, at arm's length okay so i think games industry will, will consumers are in a very unique position where they are closer to the producer of their product than in many other industries. So right. the, their voice is much more listened to than, for, for instance, I'm thinking, you know, um, you, you know, the, the McDonald's workers or something, right? So like the, the person, the person that they're selling, perhaps the, the burger to like, will not be as easy of as mm. as easy aware easily aware of the issues that the McDonald's worker is having to deal with right or in any corporate other corporate job perhaps again the relationship between the the consumer and the producer is much is much more uh, is, is 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 you know is much more invisible whereas work uh, games consumers a lot of the time they are on social media they are vocal and really what we can ask for is just you know every little bit on or every little tweet that you can do towards the companies that have really abused their workers that is always extremely helpful content creation i've been extremely uh, impressed by jim sterling jim Quisition, who has yeah. really taken the time to, to talk about these issues and again if for better or for worse uh, gaming communities do have their influencers and they do influence opinions and then i think a lot of the a lot of the people that perhaps weren't aware of these issues will find out because of people like you doing these podcasts or because of people like Jim Sterling that really have a huge reach. So something like top six of his uh, 15 latest videos at one point were the most popular ones were on workers' rights. So not only that people, you know, that this content gets created, it is certainly popular and watched by what I assume to be quite a young audience. So that's incredibly exciting. But really researching um, the modes of production of a particular game um, is very important. I am also, and I'm now sort of saying this as just um, a, 
uh, someone that is looking at games industry in a critical point of view in terms of my content, I don't think we should be stopping just at game studios and game creation. I am interested for our movement in talking about modes of production to grow into um, something that the fashion industry is well ahead of us, talking about uh, terrible working conditions on in the factories of the gadgets where, where, where we're enjoying games are created, right? So right. whether that's the mineral um, mines in Democratic Republic of Congo or the Foxconn factories in China, something that we're completely ignoring and yet um, you know, the conditions there are terrible and much worse than probably whatever happens in the worst games uh, games industry studio. And that's something that uh, we are still very much silent about. I'm obviously hopefully gain, trying to gain momentum first on these issues and establishing worker solidarity here. But we have to be um, we have to understand that we mustn't just stop here. That this is a much wider much wider issue. And, and so I'm, I'm interested, you know, to sort of ta start talking to consumers about these issues as well, and not just stop about, a talk, uh, not just stop um, these conversations on, on studio level. But yeah, create content, research most of production, spread the word. Um, I think Game Workers Unite UK have their merch, so buy the merch. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I think they will also have like a, a like a donations website as well. Cool. And I think um, thus far, it's been a extremely, um, you know, it's, it's been they will they have been extremely transparent as to uh, where the money is spent, and I think that will continue in the future. And yes, I I I, I think that the consumers in this industry more than in any other, uh, even more than in the tech industry, I would say certainly can make that difference. Uh, speaking of uh, people who uh, donate to things th that they support, um, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions from our patrons? Sure. Gladly. Awesome. Uh, first one comes in from Ralph Elliott. He asks, uh, when looking for new members, uh, do these true trade unions target specific companies? I'm sure indie developers are important too, but surely the power of a union comes from having members who are working at larger corporations. Um, is that something that you're sort of, uh, the trade union chapters sort of actively do or or is, is there any reason why they wouldn't be able to, to do that type of thing? I think there are meetings currently being t taking place with... Um with the uh, workers of a few companies that have come together and said that we want to unionize our entire company, uh, they're actually surprisingly more, some of the some of the bigger ones, and they're meeting with the. Uh, as this is I'm talking about the GWUK, of course, and they're looking how to how to come come to bosses saying like, look, a few of us have organized and we want to unionize this uh, this trade union. In terms of indies, we had a really lovely response from a few of them uh, messaging, actually the bosses messaging, being like, hey, I am not going to join the union. Well, first of all, because they're not eligible as bosses, but also because it just wouldn't make sense. But I actually think that for the betterment of my workplace, it only makes sense that the people do so if we could if we if we could do that as soon as possible that that would be great um, another thing that the union is planning is uh, sort of a, a accreditation system for studios that have um, that have uh, that have really great working conditions so not only to be on the defensive but to also celebrate good working conditions so I guess we'll start with small indies and then you know once a few of enough of them are, organi uh, are organized we can push towards the triple A's being like hey guys if these people can do it then you can do it of course too so really that there so if you, if you read through the GWUK um, uh, 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 eligibility rules mostly it's like the jo the bosses can't um, can't um, join and then people that just don't have any contract at all I suppose so if you're like a student and not working or if you're working just you know, just for a mate, then there's really unlikely that a union can help with you a lot in the UK employment law. But the, no, I can't say that we have really focused on on a, a bigger versus smaller sort of um, thing. And a lot of freelancers are joining as well. So that's really exciting. But yeah, the, the more the better. And yeah, the union's actively sort of talking with a, a few studios, etc. Uh, that sort of bleeds into the next question I have here from Nick, who's asking what positions uh, the union would cover. Um, you sort of answered already, but I'll, I'll, I'll just throw this one at you as well, because it is an important part of the conversation. Uh, QA, quality assurance, uh, traditionally gets shafted when this topic comes up. And I'd argue that if anybody gets abused the most during cr crunch, it could be QA. Most times it's uh, waved away with the excuse that that's outsourced. Um, but that, of course, is uh, some, not all studios. So you're saying that at least the, 
the work that the sort of uh, the the uh, IWGB. Uh, I guess that's all that's covered as well. That type of like outsourced or contract labor, right? Hundred percent. I think QA workers, from what we're hearing, especially here in the UK, are the ones that are getting the worst deal for sure. You hear of of zero hour contracts. You hear of abysmal pay, even in London. Uh, you hear of terrible crunch. QA workers are certainly the prime uh, contingent contingent to be unionizing, and so that's something that they should definitely be looking into, especially since uh, the the their, you know the monthly fees there are um, divided into different pay grades. So people that are you know not earning enough, they they really won't have to pay that much at all, but they will have that insurance. And also, if enough people in the studio. Uh, unionize then they can ask you know like okay you guys you're ending zero hour contract or if we're outsourced all right we're not we you have to bring us back in house you know no agency work and IWGB is actually extremely um, ex uh, experienced in bringing back uh, agency workers in house that's that's victories that they have achieved with uh, with with cleaners mostly and I think they're talking with a few electrician um, electricians in their branch as well where you know cleaners are outsourced in a in a particular establishment perhaps in a museum right. or something and IWGB gets together you know they, they do a lot of pressure on the media they get articles out there they do demonstrations outside you know um, outside the venues and whatnot and and the and the uh, institutions usually cave in and then bring those workers back in house which is which is an incredible uh, achievement for sure. So yeah, QAs are, are very much, I think, the sort of prime uh, membership material. But obviously, everyone else. So you know, I, I I know your other question. <laughs> no, your other question was like, so who 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 should be looking into this? Um, really, I, I, the, the, I think the mo the main focus has been at I suppose. Uh, you know, developers and artists, etc. But even if you're at the games, you're in a games uh, company and you're at like HR or whatnot, you should be still looking at, at joining this union. Uh, perhaps there are other unions that perhaps would be of more interest to you, but I think IWB is, ju is just sick and everyone should join in, in general. Right. But, um, <laughs> Uh, yes, so it really, it, as long as it is sort of in your work in a game studio, then you should be eligible. There is now conversation now even like at some point in the future to bring in board games. So that's exciting. My personal sort of dream uh, down the line would be esports players. I think that's something else that's been completely sort of over glamorized, etc. Whereas these workers are doing you know, and it's not perceived as work, but actually sports players are creating profit for someone else. A lot of the time they're sort of chewed up and spat, spat out. And uh, yeah, I think esports is a space where unionization, uh, conversations around that will be happening very, very soon. Yeah, it's it's interesting you mentioned that we uh, interviewed uh, Scott Smith, uh, Sir Scoots, he's known as. Oh, in, he's a legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an absolute legend. He's uh, set up the uh, Players Association, which is a sort of, uh, I guess, a Counter-Strike professional players uh, union, uh, which is uh, trying to do some of the things that you're talking about there. It's, it's, so you see, it's a, this is interesting. This is a conversation I had with him, and we've had this one disagreement, whereas I think he shouldn't be afraid of the word union. Right. I think he thinks that union, uh, you know, a word union has certain connotations, attached to it whereas association doesn't that is a bit scary to the to the employer or whatnot i think that we should be like uh going back to the roots of what you know of, of the victories that union is a unionization has achieved and really been and reclaim this word from the i guess failures of the past 40 years of some of the unionization efforts but uh yeah he sort of he, he went more towards the safer routes but we'll see how it will go in the future <laughs> Do you, could, could there be a sort of an element of uh, a difference in uh, culture between the UK and the US with that one? Because the other big union that I think of here is SAG-AFRA, which, you know, they, they refer to themselves as a sort of a, a guild rather than a union. And, and they do represent people within the games industry in so far as video game voice actors. There was that famous um, strike back in 2016 and went all the way into 2017. Um, yeah, do you think there's, do you think it's, there's a, a cultural um, difference? I, I guess you must think there is because that's you've got all your chapters working independently yes yeah, you know what perhaps you're correct you know it's 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 here in the uk that we've experienced really crushing 
uh, really substantial crushing from political actors in the 1970s to do with miners and many other industries that have now been outsourced. So the so word union has a very particular historical connotation uh, that has been lost and has been co-opted by the sort of new labor view of what a trade union looks like. And I think we're just trying to reclaim that. But I know what you mean, that, that as you say, SAGAFRA is extremely effective as an association uh, in the US. And perhaps if that's a more fitting uh, description of what essentially hopefully will be the same thing then so be it but you know i just think that yeah we shouldn't be afraid to to really underst understand that st stuff like you know pensions and and weekends and maternity leave they've uh, these have all been brought by by trade unions in 20 in 20th century uh, sometimes under terrible oppression from the states and that there is a history that in that word that we should be taking with pride yeah, absolutely. It it seems like the sort of the, the history of um of union busting is is uh is seems to be relatively well known. Yeah, no one ever says association busting, right? Like no one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and uh, it you know in recent weeks, even just looking at the 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 government shutdown that happened here, ultimately it was a uh, you know the union of of uh, of air traffic controllers, which were the one that finally sort of. Uh, uh, beat down that door and, and got, you know, a million, almost a million people who are, who are working for free. Like it, it seems like it's on the tip of everyone's tongue. I, I, I want to talk uh, about a question just quickly. We got here from Ferhat who lives in Berlin, who um, is asking the question that, that I said, I have no idea how, uh, or if there is such a thing in the U S are there any good examples? Uh, this individual is also living in Berlin. Can you tell us where game workers unite international, where the chapters are, where, whereabouts, um, you know, uh, they're located so people who are maybe listening can can get involved yeah game workers uh, unite deutschland is definitely a thing and you should definitely be looking them up um i i i, sp I spoke with them recently and they're looking at at um at setting up at, at, at being a bit more active than they have been uh but again the, the law is so different in different countries that some countries i find it way easier to to establish a trade union than others right, right. okay yes people across the world if you live in Atlanta, Austin, Australia, Baltimore, Bay Area, or Boston, Brazil, Chicago, Dallas, DC, Detroit, Deutschland, Spain, Los Angeles, Montreal, New York City, Orange County, Orlando, Ottawa, Seattle, Sweden, France, Toronto, Tri Triangle, United Kingdom, or Vancouver, there is a Game Workers Unite chapter in your area. If you are a games industry worker quietly suffering in any of these places, definitely get involved, check their Twitter, check their websites, get on their Discord channels, um, meet up with them, and, 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 and really start understanding that you, you should not be, you know, you should not be in feeling guilty or abused in the position that you are. If your city or country hasn't been read out, then set up your own, you know, these, <laughs> have these. no, but really, so now there's someone that got in touch being like, hey, I think a few of our friends are in Singapore would like to do something along that along these lines. How do we do this? And we're like, OK, yeah, so these are the little things that you do get the scored, then we're going to hype you up on our social media, then more people will join you. And again, you, from the international, from the international, you know, and again, these things, yeah, they're just springing up like mushrooms after rain, after, you know, in this drought, <laughs> if I can use such a cheesy metaphor. <laughs> but it's certainly something that uh, it seems like across the world, everyone's very, very thirsty for it. So yes, definitely the German one is there. And uh, US, it, that's not legal. There are no legal trade unions just yet. I mean, it, there's not even a year of this of this movement yet. And already so much has been achieved. If anyone wants a list of those again, you can go to gameworkersunite.org and there's a, a map that has all of them in there. It's amazing to see so many of them close to, to me here at Baltimore, DC. And uh, I guess the triangle area is North Carolina. It's, it's you know, the, there seems to be quite a lot of them. Even just looking at Europe, um, I'd love to see a little 
pin on Ireland. I know Immersh is a really good organization that operates out of Ireland. There sort are of... conversations going. There are conversations going. Oh, cool. Ireland. That'd be, that'd be, yeah, it'd yeah, be yeah. awesome to see something over there because I, I know there's a, a great spirit of um, revolutionary advocacy uh, <laughs> in my home country. <laughs> um, uh, I have uh, one more question here. This one's from uh, from Sharky81 on Twitter who says, I'm pro I'm pro unionization. Creators must have good working conditions. But could this mean that making games could take even longer uh, than now? A lot of AAA titles have four or five years of development, uh, even with crunch. Um, what would you say to that? Do you, do you think sort of crunch is a is a is is an element of game design that makes them come faster, or is it a, a product of, of bad planning and you know worker manipulation that could could be? Could... <laughs> I think you know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> but yeah, bit, bit of a loaded uh, question there from my part. Sorry. <laughs> So, so I think whereas perhaps, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, crunch perhaps was an accident uh, and it was, I suppose, I don't know, a, a, a failure of management or whatnot. Right now, it certainly is plan of the management. It is part of the project creation. It is, it is sound, no, it is, that culture is now so embedded uh, and sometimes workers are even like kind of competing between each other who is going to do more crunch you know the culture is so rotten that we just have to call the whole thing out that it's you know obviously managers are yeah i also think they're just failing and they you know whatever it is that they're doing is inexcusable because it wor hurts workers so much but the things have become so bad that there's literally now you know there and there's so little solidarity and it's so and it, it is a it's such an individualized industry that it's some so sad to see sometimes even workers you know kind of volunteering to do more work than the other and that's how they feel like they're going to get promotion or something like that in terms of like uh, games taking even longer to be made i i'm kind of a bit like well boo hoo you know that that's if that means that workers are going to have better lives then I think that's worth it. Of course, I mean, you look at company, huge company like Apple, you know, it turns out, you, you know, um, uh, an iPhone very, very easily because they're uh, outsourced in Foxconn and, you know, workers there get, I don't know, $10 a day um, or, or something like that. And they're, you know, they're just terrible accidents and incidents that you hear of in, from those factories, etc. And but is that what we want games industry to be? I, I'd like to think not. And I'd like to, uh, to, to think that there are ways perhaps of employing more people or, 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 or you know, just the more creative ways of um, implementing certain features to the game that need to be found. Like, I don't know, it's kind of, it, things are so bad now that if, 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 if it's going to now uh, affect the company, the fact that workers want better conditions, they just have to come up with a better plan. They just have to completely, if that means completely rethinking their business strategy, their pr production management strategy, or throwing in their, um, you know, whatever the, they save in the vaults of the, the sort of investment money, perhaps uh, not towards the studio the hardware or whatnot, but towards, uh, you know, I guess, recruitment and human resources and that then that's just something they have to do. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, like change, times have changed. 2018 has proven that you can't get away with stuff anymore. And if that means there needs to be some sort of like revolution and rethinking as to how they make games, well, that's on them, but it can't be on the lowest, well, it can't be on the workers. That's it, times have changed, get on with the program. Marian Tishkovita, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, where can people find you on the wild world of the internet? So I, I post all of my controversial opinions on at Mariam did on Twitter. Uh, and my YouTube channel really is just the archive. I mostly post my videos on Twitter first and then I only archive on, on YouTube. But it's left, left up. Uh, and yeah, do check out my portfolio. I've written a lot of articles. I've done lots of panel discussions and guest lectures. I'm interested in sort of um, gaming community is the push, the you know the the way to for progressives to reclaim this space in an empathetic manner, um, and look at the modes of production of this huge industry and how can we change the cultural hegemony towards the better. Danny, thank you so much for covering this. It's been a huge pleasure, and uh, I think we should be celebrating what we have achieved in the last year. Game workers of the world unite, and let's see what happens.
Awesome. Um, I have one more question for you, actually, uh, because I watched a really good um, uh, uh, lecture you did at the University of Lincoln. Just before I let you go, I'm, I'm basically saying you can take off your Game Workers Unite hat now and put on uh, your sort of uh, left, left up hat uh, for this question. Um, you, you did a really good talk. It's on available on your YouTube channel um, at the University of Lincoln. And there was one element that stood out to me. Uh, well, sorry, it didn't stand out to me, just in relation to this podcast, because next week our guest is Lucas Pope, who made Papers, Please. Oh. <laughs> so I, I i'm i'm interested in your perspective on this because obviously um return of the Oberdin came out this uh, last year and um, his his previous game papers please um sort of was came to great critical uh, acclaim um obviously your perspective i think is incredibly valuable on this not just as somebody who sort of rallies against that sort of uh milk toast pat yourself on the back liberalism that sort of has dominated a lot of the the speak of the left over the past couple of years but also as somebody who's from lithuania you know the baltic state a former soviet bloc nation um and and the sort of uh, you know made up country of that game um obviously lends itself somewhat to, to to that sort of general culture um uh politically um so in that talk you sort of talked about how the game was you know sort of you don't like political games as it were um can you speak to that a little bit? Like, what is it about political games that you think is it's sort of preaching to the choir a little bit more? Like, it doesn't actually change minds or, or, or make people, you know, uh, do any sort of on the ground uh, uh, political work after they've played them? Yes. Oh, fascinating. Right. So I have to give a bit of context here. Uh, my master's was in art and politics. It was at the politics department of Goldsmiths University. And the entirety of that course was an attempt to to really understand how culture and uh, can can affect political change or the other way around. And uh, we, there, there was a lot of sort of dissection of political art in particular. So. I, I think I've gained a very I've, I've gained an understanding and a critique of political fine arts that I've, I'm then applying to the games industry, which is obviously very very late in this game when it comes to political themes. Right. And the trend that has uh, that has sort of sprung up in 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 the fine art department has been uh, especially since sort of post 9/11, post kind of. Um, post 2001 WTO riots, etc., mm. was that kind of trend of, of very, of very kind of attempting to be highbrow political art that really doesn't look in, into its own modes, modes of production because it is very kind of edgy and fashionable and cool to uh, to to sort of to to create an object that 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 kind of gives you that high status of someone. That is uh, that is thinking of politics, you know. That it sort of straight away it puts you into some sort of like a, 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 a holier than thou category. Whereas you know, real activism and real uh, I hate, I even hate that word activism, but real change requires us looking into um, you know global manufacturing chains and look at modes of production and looking at um, you know how our western i suppose um, you know con consumerism in a very real manner uh, is affecting the global south and these are questions that are not necessarily uh, solved by by these tokenistic pieces of art you know i'm just sort of thinking oh you know ice uh, ice uh, polar bears or right. you know or you know stuff like that stuff like this that is just as we as as you basically uh, just said before it's just preaching to the converted i don't think there is a political project in there that is just basically a way for particular artists to feel a bit better about themselves uh with the fact or even edgier or cooler with the fact that they've touched on a political theme I am yet to find anyone. Um, so yeah, so I basically then wrote a critique of Papers, Please about two years ago that kind of got uh, gained a bit of traction um, where I say that Lucas Pope has, you know, created this, this, this somewhat, yeah, I suppose like one of the first viral politically charged uh, video games then was kind of traveling across the world, collecting awards, collecting a BAFTA for himself mm. and not ever really talking about real issues of, 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 of migration, of our brutal borders, of the fact that the United Kingdom, where he collected the BAFTA, um, imprisons hundreds of people in really brutal detention centers. So basically, he used a very particular, I guess, um, theme, you know, he sort of like picked up, picked a particular um, 
battle that is not his that he hasn't really done anything with it hasn't really created any you know he hasn't pointed it out uh, pointed the capital that he gained from it i don't mean material capital i mean social mm. capital towards any real organizations that are actually s trying to solve the migration um what, issues or whatever you call them um and i just felt it was such a yeah just a, it's a very sort of lazy liberal attempt uh, and a very self-glorifying attempt uh, at, at politics that uh, I think should be uh, should be should be challenged. I think there are way more creative ways to achieve to achieve cultural significance and 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 to create and and to basically attempt to um, convince people from the other side than this. So I actually have examples in fine art when I think certain videos. Oh, sorry, sorry, cert certain fine art. Uh, artists do do, do mm. that so that would be Santiago Sierra uh, who um, really works with um, actual migrants in his work and then puts himself on the on the on the line as to being um, you know so he pays for instance uh, a, a, a prostitute um, a, a dose of a do, uh, the amount that a dose of heroin would cost and then he tattoos something on her and some people were like, hey, but, you know, what are you just uh, kind of abusing a prostitute or something? He, and then the prostitute actually tells that this person has given me more time and has looked at my issues more than most of these people that come to galleries ever would, you know. Or Hans Hacke, who has actually done a lot of investigative journalism into Manhattan real estate um, uh, industries and then in literally in a gallery just produced all the evidence of corruption so again that's sort of real engaging with particular issues and trying to find a solution in terms of video games i was very impressed by uh, the uber game right. which is you know it sounds like a political it sounds like a political game but uh, it, it, the uber game was um, basically it's an uber simulator you are just a driver and it kind of looks like it's not that much difficult of a job and i will sp well, spoiler alert basically <laughs> uh, at the end of it all it seems like you've actually actually earned a lot of money and then at the end of the game um you know, all the sort of your expenses go away and actually you see that you've earned like four four dollars an hour etc but that's not what interests me about it the, what interested me about it is its modes of distribution this game was released by financial times which is a center oh, wow. right wing video uh, sorry newspaper right so it if it was released by the guardian i would just think it's another quite sad uh, liberal attempt but because it is released by a right wing medium I think it has an opportunity, it has a chance of actually changing someone's mind. So I think modes of distribution are a much more interesting way to apply politics into gaming than the form of them or the plot of them. That's why I've been very, very critical of the new Brexit games, right. you know, that are just like, ooh, <laughs> Brexit will be a dystopia and play <laughs> in this like terrible zombie land Brexit. It's like, is there going to be a Brexit voter that you're going to show this video game to that is going to be like, oh, shit, yeah, you're right. Crap, that's true. It will be a dystopia. Right. No, it's just preaching to the other Lib Dems, you know. And yeah, I just think it's such a lazy attempt at politics. However, it gets, gives you a lot of social capital and it kills me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so that's a long response to this, but I've just got so much. No. Oh, I've got a lot of passion. I, towards well, I appreciate it, Mariam. Thank you so much for your passion and your incredible insight. Uh, and thanks for sharing it uh, with us today. Uh, we'd love to have you back on. Uh, maybe to talk about Game Workers Unite after another year or so. Who knows? Yes, hopefully all, all the victories will happen the next year. Thank you so much for covering this. Our pleasure. Uh, if you're listening, thank you so much for, for well, you are listening because you're listening. Uh, thank you so much for <laughs> following uh, following our work. Uh, you could follow us at Noclip Video on Twitter. Um, I'm at Daniel Dwyer on Twitter. Uh, you could hit up or slash Noclip for uh, all our uh, subreddit stuff, including um, uh, a bunch of sort of outreach stuff we're doing on there. If you're a patron, of course, you get access to all of our uh, special patron posts as well. Special thanks for patrons for making all of this possible. Uh, the podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. I think that's a thing. Google Play play we have a youtube channel up with the podcast uh, archive separate to our, our regular video stuff so go searching for that uh, you can get the show earlier for our five dollar tier but otherwise it is uh, ad free and supported by our incredible patrons uh, to listen to a day later thank you so much again for listening at patreon.com slash no for any more details on how to fund our work and even if you don't we will see you next week see you then